everyone, and welcome to the Knighted Ones podcast, episode number 3535, folks. As a reminder, we are the only podcast that features a former UCF national champion, a former UCF radio host, an infamous rapper, an IG star shooting the breeze talking UCF sports, and this week, unfortunately, we don't have an interview. However, uh, we are working for those. This are the dog days of summer uh, where uh, camp is out. Uh, basketball's over. Uh, we still got baseball going, and and they're in a uh, a height uh, a run for the um, NCAA tournament. Uh, but largely, this is it's a little bit of a slower time. So we're going to try to introduce and sprinkle in some of our good friends uh, for interviews, and we still have Utah uh, to a uh, Utah insider to talk with. And then, uh, you know, obviously we've got a Colorado. So we're going to try to get D Neon Dion, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to pull him since he doesn't even talk to recruits, let alone uh, shows. That being said, let's get this week started. And to uh, start us off, no, bruh. Hey, now. Oh, we yeah. got it. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You went that? Well, I can't say that because that would be an automatic B. Uh, so we're going to leave that alone. Uh, I'll put that in the private chat. But uh, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, keeping us on track and uh, making sure that we have excellent quality even when we're under the water. So uh, appreciate you, bro. Next, let's go ahead and bring in Alan Levin. Alan. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. What's what? going on, guys? We're in the energy this week. I think he had an extra Mountain Dew before he came on. A couple Mountain Dews, yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. Oh, like a spider monkey, right? Like a spider yeah. monkey. All right, spider monkey. That may be your new name. <laughs> all right, uh, next we've got Ben. What's, what's up, up, Ben? What's up? No hat <laughs> Ben. <laughs> what's up, guys? Uh, good to see you, brother. And... Uh, Next, uh, we've got Trey Neal. What's up, Trey? What's up, guys? How you doing? Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your yours doesn't work like Ben's. Ben's still trying to Can't do, do it. it. It's not doing it. It's not working anymore. There we go. There All it right. is. There it is. And you got a thumbs up. Fireworks and a thumbs up, Trey Neal, for your intro. Nice. Uh, let's let's see what Josh gets. All right. Last but not least, but always last, Josh Lazar. You go. forgive, you forget, but you never let it. Go. What's up, everyone? Hey, that was the shortest one yet. All well, right. you know, I, I tried to keep it real for K Dot, and unfortunately, that is probably the most well known rap lyric in the uh, world at the moment because, of course, it's off of a cut of uh, Bad Blood by Taylor Swift. So uh, that's why everyone must know who that is. I forgot you were a Swifty. I know she I know she released an album this this week, but I have not listened to it and I refuse to. Until Florida. My daughter, until my daughter gets in the car and makes me. So there we go. I heard they're actually offering a Taylor Swift class at UCF now. So Not at UCF. That's a, at the cows. The AAU accredited cows have. Oh, I could have swore they. No, no, UCF. UCF has a class. Yeah. yeah. UCF does too. Right. Yep. Oh my goodness! Why? It's What's the class about? Uh, it's just about the life and <laughs> exactly. No, no. You you said it perfectly there, Josh. <laughs> I took I took tennis as a class at UCF. Come on, I took bowling as a class at UCF. I, Taylor Swift is fine by me. Uh, well, we know she's fine by you because you're a Swifty. We've already established that. This I week. wouldn't go yeah. that far, but you know, I I, I I'm uh, married to one. Now, uh, see, you could you could have just said haters gonna hate 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 hate, hate and that would have <laughs> been the perfect intro for that. But all been. right. Uh, let's let's stop talking about Taylor Swift. She's getting enough pub this week. Um, and uh, let's get into a little UCF football. As we talked about, uh, it is the off season, unfortunately, and Nober just dipped on us again. He just, he's just so slick with it now. He just dips yeah, himself out like of the conversation. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'm gonna go grab my burrito now. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, she's um, we're 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 getting rid of her. What, what was it the baseball team had this week? What The ERA, whatever. 
the Eras Tour. The Eras Tour, whatever it was. It, for ERA, I think that was the uh, goal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and we lost that game against Central Michigan, so let's not bring that back again, okay? I'm just going to say that now. Uh, but it is the offseason, so we won't have as much to talk about. Camp is over. We've, we've watched the spring game. Uh, we're now uh, going into portal season uh, in earnest. Uh, we've got some news on that that we're excited to share with you and basketball portal news as well. Uh, that was positive for UCF. So that's good because we haven't really had much positive portal news for the UCF basketball team, but we do now. So we're excited to talk about that. The world of college football continues to change and more and more information is dropping on rules changes and, uh, also on how the playoff came to be and how, the revenue splits were, and of course, the the evil empire that is the SEC and the Big Ten. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit this week. Um, and, um, you know, some of the rules changes are interesting. It's looking more and more like the NFL the further we go along. So let's get into it. Um, let's start with a transfer uh, portal update. Alan, you're pretty good at keeping up with this stuff. So why don't you start us off there? Yeah, yeah. Um... Since the portal opened back up for this window, uh, we've had mostly outgoing guys so far. I think we already we already talked about Timmy McLean, but I would say the biggest name um, that left us was uh, starting safety. Nakai Martinez surprisingly uh, left, even though he had a starting spot. But it did look like um, he was getting pushed out with just the DBs we brought in during the initial window in the fall. And I guess he didn't have the best spring. Um, so I guess maybe the writing was on the wall and he wanted to find another opportunity where he could play um, outside of that four other transfers, uh, two wide receivers, Goldie Lawrence, who was with us for a few months, didn't even uh, was came for, came with the, uh, over in the fall cycle and uh, decided to leave a few months later. So I guess we are not going to see Goldie Lawrence. Um, then also Steven Martin, who's been on UCF's roster now for a number of years, like three or four, he's transferring out. And then two other DBs, um, both from the 2023 class, Jameric Morris and Jason Duacona, um, are both in the portal. So that's a total of 22 outgoing transfers for UCF, 10 on um, offense, 12 on defense, and DB and wide receiver make up the most, uh, the bulk of those transfers, uh, 10 out of the 22. So those are two positions UCF will look to kind of restock, which got started there, um, kind of pivoting over to incoming transfers. We, uh, the big news of the week happened yesterday. Uh, we landed former Ohio State safety, a four star prospect uh, out of high school, Cedric Hawkins. So that was a big name um, coming out of high school, um, someone that was recruited by nearly every big school in the country. In including UCF. UCF was big time there. Correct. And he played at Coco. Um, so obviously a, a pipeline that we want to open, which we do actually have a Coco uh, recruit in our current 2025 class, the offensive lineman joiner. Um, so maybe we're starting to build a little of a pipeline there. But um, Cedric Hawkins is coming over. Um, he's six foot 185 pounds he redshirted for ohio state last year so did not play at all but you know someone had a really dynamic high school career um had well over 250 tackles uh in his high school career had i think about 15 picks in high school um like i said someone was recruited very heavily um, was rated as a top 50 safety in the nation a top 60 player in the state of florida um, so this is an exciting get someone that obviously will be immediately eligible and will have four years of eligibility left. So, you know, we've kind of talked about this. UCF has a lot of DBs in the, you know, in the secondary right now. I, I don't know how it's going to shape out a ton of transfers, a, a ton of guys that are just returning from last year. So it'll be interesting to see how Hawkins fits in, but, um, that seeming seems like a big get with a lot of potential and, and a lot of time left still in college. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack from that little segment there, and thank you for sharing all of that. So I'm going to work my way from the bottom to the top. There you go. There's another lyric here. there for you. Yeah, exactly. And now we're here. So, um, you know, talking about Hawkins a little bit, and you kind of uh, alluded to it, um, he's a, a huge, huge, huge tr uh, trigger for a lot of the guys that we're recruiting for Coco right now, uh, Jalen Boggs being one of them. Uh, he's a, pri a primary target for us uh, in his position. 
And uh, there's a few other people that were looking to flip from other teams based on um, that commitment as well. So Coco's always uh, got really, really good talent. We've got some connections there with the head coach that's over there right now, a former UCF player. Um, Ryan Schneider. Yep. Unfortunately, and he's a big UCF proponent. Unfortunately, he's um, sent a lot of people to UF and uh, UM and FSU, et cetera. So we're, we're really trying to break down the barriers there with, with Coco because that program is really strong. It's a feeder program for the region uh, where a lot of kids are transferring from, quote unquote, smaller schools to go to Coco um, to play there. And it's really, really, really uh, dominated that area. So that's exciting. Hawkins, um, like you said, was a four star uh, player, but really uh, he was one of the top DBs in the entire country last year. He was someone we were after, uh, and we were in it for a very long time, ended up going to Ohio State, didn't play, um, and so decided to come back to UCF. And we've talked about this ad nauseum where when we recruit, we're not just recruiting for today. We're also recruiting for that transfer portal uh, if that player comes back. So um, that was really, really good. Now, you mentioned Goldie um, a little bit here. He was someone that we were in the mix for. He ended up going to FSU. Um, you know, it was a it was a big decision on whether he was going to come here or whether he was going to go to FSU. He came here, and um, unfortunately, with Goldie, it's it, this wasn't really his decision to transfer. Um, he reportedly was missing practices, uh, was late to the spring game, um, and those were some of the same reasons why. Uh, he didn't do well at FSU and was was asked to leave there. So uh, Goldie Lawrence, hugely talented receiver, good size, good skill set, um, but a lot to learn as far as, you know, what the consistency that you have to have as a D1 uh, power four for now uh, athlete. So, um, you know, there's I wouldn't look at that as so much of a yes, it's a loss of potential at wide receiver. And yes, we're already out there looking for other wide receivers. We've been active in the portal uh, with some big names that are out there and that have come available as well, but it's not as huge of a loss if that's what he's going to bring to the table on the day-to-day -day with the team. Um, Nakai Martinez, uh, Ben, I don't know if you remember this, but you and myself and Andrew, we were super excited when we got him um, when yes. we were on uh, Nightline. We, we, yep. Uh, wax poetic about him. Great kid. Um, he he kind of started that trend of four stars um, starting to come UCF's way as we geared up for the Big 12. I think everybody, local kid, um, you know, he he helped with the um, state of Orlando, um, you know, attempts. And he did a great job in recruiting other people and local talent to UCF during that whole buildup. Unfortunately, I think this is more of a situation where uh, Coach Malzahn said he was going to, after the spring game, have sit downs with everyone and kind of let everybody know where they were at. And he kind of saw the writing on the wall. PFF, his performance was not great last year. It was one he of the, a good year. Yeah, according yeah, to all that. Yeah. One of the lowest uh, performer uh, safeties there. Uh, and, you know, all last season, what were we talking about? The whiffs, right? So he yeah. had 30 missed tackles last year. And, uh, as a safety, or 30% of his tackles were missed tackles last year. As a safety, you cannot do that, especially as the last line of defense. Question, so, with the yeah. PFF grades, where did he finish? Because I'm going to be honest, just watching him, he he was one of our better safeties, in my opinion. So he finished 239 or something like that? I mean, like, amongst our team. Like our, our I think he was running lower on our team. He was behind... Yeah. Um, the, I guess the middle Tennessee state kid. And um, he was like, I would say like lower middle of the pack, I would say. Yeah. So he, he was in the fifties a lot of times, like fifties to sixties, which yeah, fifties is a, like average. And unfortunately with the program where we're at right now, you, you can't do average, especially when you're not playing in the big 12 or when you're playing in the big 12 and trying to compete for championships. So I think it's, yeah. I think it's more about how he developed and the talent that we brought in and the it talent is, uh, that we are bringing in and, and his ability to get playing time because we've certainly upgraded. So in the, in the uh, spring that he was 
not they did not have him as a starting safety and a lot of the uh first team rotations they're rolling with like Quadric Ballard, uh Ladarius Tennyson, uh William Wells, Quadric. uh who's been around for a while, but he was uh not getting first team reps. 30 wait, Quadric what what number is he? I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, he, he, he was a, injured he most was of his e brace last year, right? He was injured most of last year, yeah. But he the year before that, he's been he was a start he's he's like a fifth year yeah. senior. He's been a starter for like I want to say three out of the last five yeah. years. So yeah, but even then, uh, I think some of the talent that we brought in, the Cincinnati uh, uh, yeah, guy, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, w the talent that we brought in, we've definitely upgraded talent. So um, unfortunately for Nakai, he's a little bit smaller for a safety as well, which which didn't yeah. help him. I mean, when he was trying to tackle Oliver out of OSU, it was uh, it was interesting to try to. Uh, there was a lot of uh, arm tackling going on there, not a lot of, uh, you know, and leg tackling, diving that, at that, leg. that was our secondary group. Yeah. Emma. Well, he he unfortunately, I, I think it's just a size disadvantage, and and maybe the way that they were being coached. But uh, Ted Roof doesn't play that game. Uh, he's very much about being aggressive, having bigger guys, and um, oh, you have to play physical to play for Coach Roof. Yeah, exactly. He's so, cool. and people forget, didn't he have like two weeks at UCF or, or a little bit? He was at three UCF weeks. before three weeks yeah. at UCF yeah, for, for O'Leary, and then I think he went to North Carolina afterwards. Yeah. So, um, you know, he's he's done a really good job. We talked about it before on on turning defenses around. So we're we're upgrading talent and size, and um, we're at the same time, you know, uh, being more aggressive and having more. Uh, disguise schemes and things like that, more complicated schemes, which will help the def uh, defense quite a bit as well. So um, I just wanted to kind of talk about those few things that were there, but uh, you know, Hawkins is, is a huge get. A lot of people were after him, even in the transfer portal, and we still managed to, to grab him. All right. Uh, let's, let's, that's our quick minute on, uh, or maybe eight minutes on uh, the transfer portal update. We've got some rules changes with the transfer portal update we'll talk about later. But uh, for now, let's start with the two-minute rule. Uh, so one of the things that the NFL that we're familiar uh, with was the two-minute rule uh, in the NFL. So it looks like it, it was approved for uh, use in college football. So that will now be in place for um, a college games as well. So that'll be a little getting used to uh, when it comes to that. Uh, transfer portal uh, rule change. Anyone can transfer at any time. So no more restrictions on the number of times they can transfer and their immediate eligibility and any of that kind of stuff. So you've got one year rentals, guys. We're, we're there. Oh, I, thought, I thought you had to be like within good standing academically. Or That's something true. Like that. You do. You yeah. do have to be in good standing. I mean, academically. let's be real about it. Which is like what, a 2.0 basically? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to go to class basically. Yes. Well, yes, that, exactly. depends on if, that depends on if you go to school in North Carolina or not. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So at at the end of the day, um, it, it's it's a situation now where it's one year players, so it's basically free agency. And and it was interesting because Coach Malzahn talked about the role of a GM now being hired. Um, <laughs> Yes, it was my my version of the frog sipping the tea. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was interesting to hear Coach Melzon talk about the idea of a, a general manager uh, for college football. And that's now come into vogue with a lot of different teams. So it's a little bit different. And, and Coach talked about this. He said it's a little bit different in the NFL version because the NFL version, they're hiring and firing coaches. Um, that's still going to, that responsibility will still uh, lie with the AD. What this person's job is going to be is just to manage uh, rosters and, uh, you know, work with the NIL collectives, et cetera, uh, to do that. One of the other changes for NIL, which is interesting, is that uh, now schools can officially partner uh, with uh, NIL collectives. So, in other words, they can pay players through NIL collectives through the school. So the school can, you know, that, that 70, 70 million dollars that the, the uh, SEC and the Big Ten will be getting paid, 
they can demark like five million of it from the school from that uh, contract and drop it into an NIL collective and use that um, to to hire players. So, and I say hire because that's exactly that's what they're doing. That's not NIL. That was not what NIL was supposed to be. How but, is this still the NCAA, like the National well, Collegiate Athletic Association? Like, how is this actually college sports anymore? It's all it, I mean, NCAA is, is trying to do whatever it takes to prevent them from branching off and becoming what it wants. That, yeah, that's I mean, well, I, I don't even, I don't even think it's that. I think a lot of this, you know, that we haven't really talked about lately was there's still that NIL lawsuit that's working its way through things and there's pressure from Congress and then local states are, are pushing it. So this is a step towards what it's going to be, which is, um, you know, schools basically going are going to have rules and just be able to play, uh, pay players directly. So taking that that burden out of it. And then I do think that eventually the players are going to not like this because their taxes, they're, they're going to be regulated and more like 1099 employees. So. Yeah. It'll still be college that needs football to happen sooner than later because this is just ridiculous. That's well, so I think that's what they're working towards, but well, they've got they've got so many things on their plate between the like no rules. Are these are they not getting tax on this money? So they're yeah, supposed I'm to be. assuming they have, they're supposed to. Oh, be. Yeah. I, thought, I mean, I don't know. Well, I'm, I'd listen, assume. So. Listen, they are. There was a they yeah. had a big um, they had a big lawyer on ESPN talking about this. They are getting taxed on this stuff. He was talking about. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. Like it was like right. Darren. Darren, um, what's that? That big just, uh, sports lawyer. Yeah, he was talking about it on ESPN. So they're so, paying so, like normal taxes. Mm -hmm. Some yeah, of these like early life. Goodness gracious! Early life lesson because tax right? avoidance. I think too. I mean, it's something Listen. that we talked a lot about uh, a number of years ago when this whole thing yeah. came to pass. It was like. Man, I, I hope that they have good advisors in place to really, you know, talk to these. I mean, athletes. They, need, they probably need to have a, a CPA, like, or an accountant. That imagine they, need they, need they, got, they got their uncle or their uncle's best friend, who's uh, now their NIL agent, who's out they there. They, to, they're good. They need to, that was they actually something I saw last week for the first time. Just, I, I mean, I know it existed well before this. I just, it was the first time I saw it on Twitter. Or it was somebody where it said X, it was some bro. sort of announcement. Yeah, X, whatever. It was some sort of announcement that, like, I don't know if the kid was transferring or something, but or maybe it was an announcement of NIL deal or something. But it, it it was a college athlete, college football player, and it said through his agent, he said X, Y, Z. Yeah. And it's like, that was the first time I just saw that. Like, I saw through his agent. And, and I think that we call it the transfer portal. I think we call it free agency because we don't know what to call it, but like free agent, this isn't free agency. This is a free for all as, as Alan well. just it's, called it's, it. I mean, because well, it's not a free, free agency not, implies that there's actual contracts in place. And it's like, not free agency quite simply. What? Yeah. Well, and that's, even that's in the exactly NFL, it. There's no, term. right. There's no, I mean, you do have, hold on, hold on, Josh. You do have a contract technically every time that you sign up for another year, right? Not, not but every, you don't every have, year. Could could you yes, imagine every NFL renewed. player able to change what they want to do every single and year? And you could, and, and it's not even every single. It could be every two months they change it. Like I was about to say, yeah, month. it's not for a full year. Not it's a not even a full year. year. It's like it could be for literally a month. Like they could sign their national of intent and go out a few months later. Like it's not like right, but the. Schools have to guarantee one scholarship year every time that they review it. They have to maintain the yeah, scholarship. Saying, Whether they're free agency, it's a free for all. Yeah, it's like because. Well, okay. So going back to what I was trying to say before you guys jumped in, uh, they do have a, a contractual agreement, a year by year contractual agreement with the school. Whether they honor it or not, or transfer again, this is this goes back to what this change is, which is, hey, uh, you can transfer as many times as you want, right? And um, there's no more restrictions on the number, like it, you having to sit out for a year if you transfer. So all of that's gone. And, you know, contrary to the NFL, there's no commitment to the team by the, by the player because they can just up and change teams whenever they want because it's, it's pretty much a year-to-year -year contract from, from now on. So, the, you know, we were having a conversation in our quote-unquote text talk about developing um, 
you know, players and how there isn't going to be a lack of, uh, there's a lack of player development. And, you know, okay, when it yeah. comes to things, what about scheme? What about technique? What about all those things that are That's taught right. with the different defenses? You, you lose, all, or offenses for that matter, you lose all that, right? If you're going from a, uh, you know, a run and shoot uh, type of offense to now a traditional SEC style pro style offense, you know, you, you, the players lose all that. They lose that repetition. They lose, uh, you know, because you don't, there's a reason freshmen aren't going to the NFL, right? And the reason for that is they still have to learn. They have to learn the techniques. They have to learn, learn the scheme. They have to understand and be fast enough to make quick decisions. Trey talks about it all the time, right? The, the, you, as a defense, you need to be able to do the pre-snap read and know what your assignment is and be able to react without thinking. And that goes away if you're not in that system long enough to learn it. I mean, Trey said it himself. The reason he went to Nebraska, controversially, uh, was uh, because he didn't want to learn a, a whole new system again before he went to the NFL draft process, right? Because he only had one year of eligibility left. That made that makes a whole lot of sense because it takes a minute to learn that. You don't learn it over a summer. You don't learn it even if you are there for uh, spring camp it and takes fall camp. A year. Before yeah, you get comfortable, it's right. over a year, at least year two, to get comfortable. Exactly. Defense. Offense, too, same way. I mean, that's why most of the teams you see, that year one is kind of just filling out the players, pause, and then just realizing who fits where. Um, the under, It's a lot of basic concept. There's nothing really – it's a lot of vanilla. Year two is where you kind of branch out, get a little bit more complex. Um, and, yeah, I mean, again, you – you don't really see guys jumping from the NFL or jumping to the NFL as freshmen because, again, you're 18 years old. It's the physicality of from high school to college is already a huge jump for 99.9% .9 of the players. Trying to make a second jump, like it's different than the NBA. A lot of guys that can do one and done or come out of high school, yeah, there's a physical kind of jump that you have to get acclimated to. But, I mean, for example, the LeBron James, Kevin Garnett's, uh, Anthony David, like a lot of the one and done guys can kind of have the skill to play in the NBA. They might not have the physicality, but they have the skill. If you don't have the physicality in the NFL, you can't play. It's just that simple. And on top of that, well, know, the, the NBA, NBA the, the NBA is a, a more of a one on one kind of thing. Right. So you're doing things to set up mismatches for one player versus the other player. Yes, you're doing that on offense, um, you know, yeah, and even defensively. You know, uh, you're trying to, you know, hide your scheme or who's going to blitz or, you know, all that other stuff. Right. But at the end of the day, um, I mean, you know, it's a the skill end, game too. like, like, like Ben even a, talked about Kevin than, Durant couldn't even bench 130, 185. Yeah. But he's one of the greatest basketball players we've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and the, and you know, the way that the game is the NBA game has changed. gone over the last 20 years. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a less physical game than it was in the 80s and 90s when yeah. you were actually able when to guys come would out. stay three, four years in college. Yeah. You know, that's that's when it was. Yeah. yeah. And but the but going back to the transfer portal, I just I, I guess. So this rule obviously evolved from we the transfer portal or the transfer rule, you know, changed a number of years ago where you could have one transfer like, you know, and then and then then you'd have to sit out if you wanted to transfer again. And because of essentially COVID, um, you know, that all, the, all, the amount of NCAA exceptions that were given out where, you know, you had guys that were transferring three or four times over the course of their college sports career, you know, that just seemed to become normal. So I guess that's where this like new official rule came from. It was just like, hey, we're just tired of giving out all these exceptions. So we're just going to make it a complete free for all. And yeah. so what's interesting about that to me is that all of a sudden, like what seems like it could never happen or seems like kind of crazy a few years ago, they just trickle in and get you used to it. And then eventually it changes again and it doesn't seem as crazy uh, or at least the established rule doesn't seem as crazy. The whole one, you know, transfer and then you have to sit out. But like what happens, in, for instance, what happens in in high school sports in Florida? Right. Florida is one of the most like pro school choice states in the country. 
And in on the athletic side, that take they, there's a lot of high schools, especially in South Florida, that kind of take advantage of that on the athletic oh, yeah. side. They're cheating. Where they're cheating. you would see you see in this, you could watch state championship football games, which all always have representation, a huge representation from South Florida, you know, high school teams. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there will be at least three starters on each of those South Florida teams that didn't start the season playing for that school. And so imagine now, so imagine now a future in college football, which is not that far away, where the starting quarterback of the national championship team started out the season on a different team. And that's something that we're now going to have to get used to in college sports because it's coming to that. And no one can say, oh, no, no, that'll never happen. It happens in high school right now. And this whole like, oh, they could just move to any school that they want. There's a number of people five years ago that said that would never happen. And so like all of this is just a downward spiral that's just going to continue to move forward. And I, I mean... You know, eventually we're going to have freaking people changing jerseys at halftime and going to the other team. <laughs> I just, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. It is. But anyways, I mean, I got, I'm glad a lot of people are really happy about the complete, I mean, there's, there's one, there's a, there's a big difference between player empowerment or athlete empowerment, you know, them being able to, you know, get, get what they, you know, need. There's a big difference between that and what we have today and what we're yeah. moving towards in the very Absolutely. near future. It just it seems like I mean, it just it just seems it just seems like it's it's gone too far already. And we're we're not even on the clo- we're on the maybe the tail end of the beginning. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I like the rule when you could get like one free transfer. And then if you did it again, you have to sit out a year. Like, yeah. Right. I mean, like that, like, that yeah. to me, it seems like you want to get out of your, you know, get out of a situation. You kind of penalty free. Like yeah. that's great. But yeah, just unlimited I mean, transfers is to me, it, it's just no consistency. It, and no it doesn't help the kid now. either. Like it, people think it helps the, the kid. It doesn't like oh, yeah, not at all. Even they, they just to compare it to the coaches leaving. And it's a dumb comparison. Yeah. And, and we're just talking coach like sports wise academically you can't transfer to some of these schools because some of them are on try what do you call them trimesters like some of these schools on trimesters some of them are are quarters yeah like it and it sometimes the credits don't carry over you become a transfer student like there's so many different loopholes and hoops that you have to jump through and it's not just it's not good for the kid and i hate kind of just talking about the academic side because we're a sports talking show but that part is a piece because again Hey, listen, they didn't come here to play school, bro. They didn't come here to play school. To be honest, most of these guys aren't going to play on Sundays. Most of these guys aren't going to play in the NBA. Most of these guys aren't going to play professional baseball. That's just the reality of it. You know, you're already kind of a one percenter playing Division I football. Then it's another one percent to make it into the one percent of the one percent to play whatever professional sport. Like, you have to have, and I get it, you want to strive for it, but you have to have some kind of plan B in a sense. And, and I don't think the NCAA, that's why I said the NCAA is just doing whatever they can to save the brand of NCAA from just becoming like, like when you sent the, the other day, the, the proposal of everybody branching off to 64. Like, I think that's a real thing unless the NCAA just kind of falls in line to whatever they want. Otherwise they're just going to say, Hey, you know what? Forget the NCAA. We're going to branch off, do our own minor league football. That's why I think they're just going to, <laughs> that's why I think they're going to be um I think this that's is, why they're applying this, obliged why gotta, this is why stuff. you got to watch the this is why you got to watch the uh the YouTube version of this no, 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 no. we we can't say this this is this is the lead that yeah. that was that was Goodness killer no, bro. Oh, that was great but yeah like great I job, just, bro. It, and I think this isn't even really like Y'all were saying it's not even really free agency because, like you said, in two months, if I don't like it, I can leave. You can't do that in the NFL. Court. You can't just you, do that. Yeah, yeah you yeah. have to write. If you sign a three-year deal, you're unless the team trades you, you're riding that three-year deal out or they cut you. That's it. You don't get to say, oh, I don't feel – you can retire, but then you don't get paid. You don't play. That's the only way you get out of it is retire. Um, 
So like this like is the NIL deals aren't bind nothing's binding at all. Like I don't even yeah. understand the point of a national letter of intent. What's the point? Like they don't need to do that. Like just no, there's just, no point. All right, I'm I mean, that's that's there. just to draw well, Johnny that's Dawkins proved that point. That, that's that's just talking <laughs> points now. Just hey, we signed this great class, you know, give me my, my bonus as a coach. That's all it really is for now. We signed. Huh. Yeah, I mean, all right. Yeah, that's wow. the thing. It's like <laughs> we all we all laughed when it was uh, I don't know who it was. I think it was even Mikey Williams. You know, I was like, I was like, talk to me when he actually plays for the yeah. team. Yeah, any exactly. player now, talk to me when they actually. I mean, what's the point of getting excited about any recruiting? Like, tell me when they actually get on the field, or yeah, actually get on the field because if they don't get in the field, they're gone anyway. They're leaving anyway. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of yeah. like what what Rob and Ben have been talking about in the chat. Is we're starting to root for, and it's not the players you know, that we don't like the players, but we're more so rooting for the universities. We're okay. rooting you don't, for players, you don't, man. You don't get enough time to, like, grow relationships with them. Yeah. I mean, shoot, Roger, how I met you no. and, like, even Ben and, like, now you guys was through the time that we got to build relationships with fans. You know, like, for sure. coming to the, uh, I forgot what it was, Fan Fest in August, talking to people after the games, talking to people, like, if we're only here for six months and then we just bounce, like it feels like the one we feel like the NCAA is just Kentucky basketball. That's what college football is. It's just Kentucky basketball. We see you play and then you leave, you know, that's, and you can't build any rapport with fans and people like that. In my opinion, I could be wrong. Well, I agree. It's like, I you got to start just, liking but, the, uh, the, 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 the grad transfers. Cause you know, you'll be, they'll be there for that one year and, and graduate at UCF. Like that's the only one you can guarantee. Right? Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing. It's like it's actually not like Kentucky basketball because Kentucky basketball, those those kids were there for one season and then that's they true. went to the NBA and became great superstar athletes in the NBA. But who do they represent when they were in the NBA? Kentucky they represented y- y- Kentucky. And and so that's the thing. It's like who like like who's Matt Lee representing today? Who's Mikey Keene representing today? Like. Yeah. Like we're we're not like we don't gain a connection because we don't have the Shaquem Griffins or, you know, we don't have the Shaquem Griffins of the world where we're like saying like that guy is UCF. I mean, you have to really wait. Hold on, make you could have said Trey Neal here. He was on the same team. Oh wait, well, no, he transferred. Uh, well, I was about to I was about to caveat no, it. Thing. No, I was about to caveat it in the sense, it, and and this is a this is a, a a legitimate caveat because we do we do hold certain players who have transferred and try out into Trey. that group. But like Mackenzie Milton, of course, like ones that make like a true impact, like, and, and they, they seem to be UCF lifers. Right. But like the, but nowadays I, I'd even say, I'd even say like Trey was the last, like Trey was one of the last uh, years where you could actually have that. Whereas, like, even like I just mentioned, Matt Lee, right? Like, we we all we view him great four year career at UCF, and and he uh, and he transferred to go get money, and and people would can't fault him for that. But by the same token, like the reason why he transferred was a lot different than the reason why Trey Neal transferred. Right. Trey Neal transferred because his coach that he had established such a relationship with, and I don't want to speak for you, Trey, but like. Like oh, yeah. he went to another school and you only had one more year of eligibility left and who could fault him really for that? Like sticking with a relationship as opposed to a relationship with money is something that people don't relate to. And that's yeah. just the way it goes. 100%. Yeah. I, so I will say this when, when I was at the spring game and this is something I noticed, but I didn't talk about in, in previous episodes, you know, who had a bigger line between RJ Harvey and KJ Jefferson? Wasn't the starting quarterback. It was RJ Harvey. It was the lifer. And I think it, it's the lifer. And I think that's now KJ had his share. Uh, and a lot of his autograph fans and that type of stuff. But there was a pretty deep line for RJ. And that's, I don't think RJ's going to transfer as well uh, on our talk back. But that's, that is, I think that might be the end of some of that too, because unless you have the nil to keep the people here and they can transfer every single year, look, I, I love the idea of good commerce, but even the NFL doesn't allow this, right? right? Even the NFL does not allow what is going on here. 
Now, the other side of that is if all the college athletes start collectively bargaining, then there'll be some th that will be the give and take. But I, but I at just, least there'll be some established yeah. rules and not this I, whatever, yeah. it, whatever this is. I mean, I, I, it's it's whatever I, this is. I'd rather have an established rule than what it is now. Like, well, I, yeah, the lack of structure is very frustrating. It's yeah, and, and, and I'm a union guy. I've been in multiple different unions. I think there's a very oh, good Josh. Oh, no. I am. Um, but the reality is, what would you... I think we would all rather know, have a known than what is going on here. Yeah. Like, some level of known. There's no Maybe. rules. I'm like... There's no rules to the amount of money a kid can make. There's no rules to where he can go. There's no rules. There's no rules. It's just whatever falls I, in your lap. I honestly, I honestly think. Happens. I honestly think what what this is, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit when we get into uh, the next portion of the segment. But uh, the, that NIL contract is out there, and the longer like or not contract the nil uh lawsuit oh, out there yeah. and the longer that goes that means more plaintiffs for that class action lawsuit that can start getting paid back money so if they can reduce some of the damages from that along the way until it gets settled guess what they're going to do i think that's what you're seeing right now can that's you briefly why explain what the lawsuit is about briefly like so, so when it comes to nil lawsuit are people trying to get more money or are past people before nil trying to get money or what's going on they're trying to say that players should be able to monetize themselves off the name image and likeness and that basically the schools and the ncaa has been making money off their backs for however long right and so they're part of that lawsuit is going to be uh past players who are going to get some right. sort of uh, recovery there. It won't be that much, Trey. Sorry. Hey, any money's good money for me. It'll be $25 in a bag of bugles. You won't even get Doritos. So, uh, <laughs> I got like, uh, I got like, like, uh, 60 bucks from the NCAA basketball game back in 2004 <laughs> or whatever that, as what? part of that original lawsuit. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. And you accepted that? You should have sued him for more, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, $60 back then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is this? Like, I'm talking about we got that like in the 1920s. Like, you like, couldn't buy a house for six. Roger, sixty dollars for me. If you give me six, oh my goodness! <laughs> hey, I always say, yeah, I'll take sixty bucks right now. Kidding me? But yeah, Ben blew that at Devaney's in one night. No, no, no. <laughs> this was like recently, dude. Like the with the with the original like nil lawsuit. Wow, that was what, like 2015. Yeah, I was like, no, it was like more recent than that. It was like. Hey, no, I didn't get 2018 that. or something. Come on, need, man. You got to get your $60 dollar. <laughs> All right. So uh, now that we've broken down Ben's uh, windfall. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, totally. NBA, right? <laughs> uh, you should also have one for short shorts because uh, I think there might have been some damage there. You, you could uh, sue them for that, too, because at that time they'd not gone to the long shorts yet. So let's see if we can do oh, that's we can, false. That's Oops. false. I grew up in no. the Allen Iverson era. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Oh, four. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, bottom line is, is they, there's multiple lawsuits. It's not just one. And um, part of it is the right to unionize uh, and collectively bargain. So part of it is, um, you know, to be able to get, that back money from the schools, how the schools have profited off of that uh, and merchandise sales. And like, that's why the NCAA game went away for a while and it's coming back now. Finally, um, you know, part of it is uh, how much they should be getting from the schools uh, themselves as a portion of that name, image and likeness, not just what they're selling to other people like outside entities. Right. So uh, there's there's a lot of different ones going through, but basically um, by opening up the floodgates and restricting less of it, there's less cause for players in the current era versus previous eras to say, hey, I've right. had real damages from this because you restricted me. So that's that's part of this because that's on the horizon. It's looming in the next year or two. And, you know, I guess I'll just go ahead and say it. Part of that conversation uh, that's going around with the Big Ten and the SEC is they're going to get hammered on the award uh, on the awards uh, for that lawsuit for the plaintiffs. And so part of them, part of the justification that they were using for having a split revenue distribution 
is that they had a higher burden uh, for that uh, for that lawsuit than anybody else is going to. So uh, we're trying to say, hey, I need we need more revenue to offset the burden that we're going to take on because. Oh yeah, but we're not going to talk about the all the revenue that they gained from those plaintiffs in that lawsuit. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys already started way up here because of those players. Like, you don't get to say, oh, future players need to offset. Hey, uh, they can say whatever they want to just yeah, whatever they want because it worked, right? So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so that's that. All right. Uh, now that we've we've jumped up and down on our, our soapboxes on that to the point where I think we cracked the soapbox, at least on the top, uh, the next rule change uh, that came out is it's actually been approved that coaches can now talk to players, um, just like the NFL, uh, where they're going to be allowed to have electronic devices. So more than likely, it'll either be the middle linebacker or safety um, for... Um, you know, the defense and then the quarterback, obviously, for the offense where plays will be able to be called. They will have to have a designated uh, like dot on the back of the helmet to say yep. that's the person that has that. Also, uh, they're going to cut off the play with it 14 seconds to go. When the play clock hits 14 seconds, they're, they have to cut off communication. Uh, they also can have uh, in-game views of uh, on their iPads um, uh, for the players. Um, as long as it's in-game views, they can't bring outside views from other, you know, games while they're playing the game, but they can show it on those iPads on what they're doing. Uh, that's also been approved. So a lot of uh, a lot of little tweaks that uh, should make things a little easier for communicating. A lot of that has to do with old, our friend uh, Jim Harbaugh and uh, everything that was going on with the <laughs> hat camera gate thing because. Um, you know, that they're just trying to find ways to get those in without having to use the cards. So those cards, you know, those big cards that flop and move away and, and you know, you have multiple multiple people all around the sidelines doing that, those may go away as those calls oh. are going to be uh, called in. Now, what does that do? It, it may not go away because, again, with no huddle type offenses and speed offenses, right, that all the players need to know what their role is and what their what's being called for their particular section. So that means you're going to need the cards because otherwise you're going to have to huddle up and um, they're going to have to have to get direction from whoever the play is getting called into. So uh, I, I don't think that'll completely go away, especially for for offenses and defenses that rely on speed um, like the UCF fast. Good. Huh? It should go away. I mean, <laughs> well, all the other players, if you're trying to get lined up fast, the, only, the only issue really is whenever like two minute if, if you have those two minute situations those no huddle situations but then even then whenever we played teams like that like a, a baylor or a memphis that just go lightning quick the calls are basic the calls are kind of we almost predetermine them so if they make a play on the right hash we'd already know the next call because of where the ball is if they make if it's in the middle of the field we know well at least i'm just speaking from my experience we kind of know <laughs> already where if the ball's in the middle of the field if it's on the right hash from the left hash this is how we play the defense i think that's how you have to be if you play those lightning quick teams um and then two minute most of the time our def and this is even coach o'leary we'd send in two calls and you bounce off of those calls just flip flop as long as the person who sets the defense which most of the time like you said roger is the mic um, or the middle linebacker and that's who probably will have the green dot just because everybody can hear him he's the center D linemen can hear them and the DBs can hear them. Um, other than that, I mean, like you said, it, it could be a problem. I don't think they get rid of cards year one. I think it kind of phases it out a little bit just because, like you said, most of the calls are going to be into the quarterback's ear, into the uh, the linebacker's ear. And then these tempoed offenses, the offense is basic too. It just operates on speed. It's it's simple. Speed and spacing. Yeah, speed and spacing. They, they count the box. If it's a light box, they're running the ball. If it's a heavy box, they're going to throw. Like, it's – that's not really the, the hard part. Um, And they may have, you know, stuff for just those specific guys. So I don't think it will completely go away. But I think the days of seeing people look over the sideline and you have four cards up and guys with different hats, I think that's going to go away. All right, so I have a question for you. What's the craziest picture that they were putting up there when you guys were out there on defense – that oh, you can we, think of. We had a lot of different ones. We had like 
Elvis. We had like a Peter Griffin out there sitting on the toilet. Like we had so many. And what did that one mean? What did that one mean? A lot of the stuff were decoys. Like it's yeah, I know that. I mean, it didn't mean anything. It, truthfully, it was just there because some people would have it up there and they think it meant something, and it wasn't. And we'd be looking at somebody with a red hat give a signal. That's it. Yeah, no, I know the, the different the color hats mean you know mean whoever it is that's wearing that hat for that yeah. particular game. Uh, uh, we we actually be each quarter. We change each quarter. Like, oh wow! Have, I didn't know you guys. Have, yeah, we we'd have a red hat for like we'd have four different guys giving signals. Um, and then we have two guys holding signs. So six people we could make calls from. Most of the times we never did it off of the off the signs because it's hard to just flip signs and just keep the same one up. Um, so we'd go off of the hats and depending right, on so, the so, first quarter, they'd say, Hey, we're going off red hat. And it'd so be tell, tell me a crazy one, like a crazy image and what it meant. We didn't the defense, we didn't go off of images, we went off of signals. So well, our images were just decoys for offense. I don't know. I mean, I didn't play offense. I know they had some crazy ones. Like I know they had um one time I think they had like a coach uh coach Verdusco's face like screaming on it and it meant something. Um <laughs> they had like a piece of cheese, which is just ran- like it's a lot of random stuff and it means stuff. Like, I'm not gonna say it now because I, I remember what it meant, but um it, it's it's Offense is a lot more in-depth than defense. Defense, we're just like, look, look at this one guy. That's what we do. And then Memphis, actually, even deeper, they knew our signal. So whenever they would see who was calling, uh, if we had four guys and every the one guy we're reading is doing this for our defense, if we on defense relate it to each other, we're doing this, they know the guy because they know our signal. So yeah. we actually had to call. We had to say it to each other what signals we were running. So we would be, for example, we'd be saying – Elvis, 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 but that's not what Elvis meant because they knew our signals. But we were saying it differently, and that was a crazy game. I <laughs> couldn't believe they knew all. Of, they knew all of our signals. Whenever we what, would do it, they would check to the perfect play to beat it. Which 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 Memphis game was that? The second one. On oh, the the championship game? Yeah that 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 second game. I mean, you can go back. So the reason why it was fifty three. Yeah, you see, that. Riley Ferguson. He was actually calling east, east, west, west. Whenever we would call something, he whenever we call rain lightning, which was a, one of our field blitzes or boundary blitzes, he would call east, east. So the blitz, say the blitz is coming from the boundary. I'm I'm getting football nerdy. If the blitz is coming from the boundary, they would run stretch to the field, so the blitz can't make a play. Yeah, right. And we're weak on that. Weak side, we're weak to the field, so every play ended up our post safety would have to make the tackle 15 yards down the field. How so how long did plays it take? make it the tackle? And some plays they break, and that's where a lot of our issues stemmed that first half until we were like, Coach Chen, they know our signals, and he's like, Well, we can go out there and give them decoy signals as long as y'all know what y'all are doing. And everybody's like, Y'all want to do it? We're like, Yeah, there's nothing to lose now, they're scoring every drive, you know. So it, it was a lot of gamesmanship with that. Um, and we kind of baited them into a lot of plays because we were doing that too. Is that how you got the interception at the end? You, uh, no, the interception was just mano y mano. We, we sent the house. I had the tight end. That was it. <laughs> like it was, they, they were, <laughs> I love that. Trey, I love the, the humbleness. I love yeah, the Trey, You have the tight end. Uh, everybody else were blitzing the quarterback. And if they run it, we should smoke it. If they throw a pass, somebody has to make a play. And that was, I mean, that was it. It was me, Kyle Gibson, Mike Hughes, and Neville Clark. We were all one on one, so right. that's what it's it a is. pretty good back four. <laughs> that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah that's and, and again, we had Richie Grant, Bam Moore, like we were loaded. Man, <laughs> Antoine Collier, we were loaded. Man, Bam Moore, was too bad he got injured. Yeah, yeah, he was an NFL guy. He was. Yeah, he was. He NFL guy. Hurt, he's playing on Sundays. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. Uh, now that we've talked about uh, the coaches talking in the helmets and signs and yeah. and Trey's Memphis experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, the PAC 12. So, you know, we've been talking about it quite a bit. Um, the PAC 12 obviously is no more. There's two teams left and it will officially be a P4. We've been talking about the P4 now ad nauseum as of August 2nd came out today, uh, that the PAC 12 will no longer be a power conference. So the, the schools that play there will be the same level, non-autonomous because that's how they designate them, uh, teams that will now be counted the exact same as the G5. So that's interesting. Uh, I, I wonder what would have happened had they been able to work something out with the uh, Mountain West to merge. 
Um, but uh, they're going to, well, you never know. I mean, you yeah. never know. ACC is next. Oh, I agree. Uh, we've yeah. talked about that before. I think the ACC is next. I think FSU and Clemson are out soon. So, yeah. Um, I think that may happen actually as we close out. Now is the quiet time where there's not a lot of uh, limelight on it. Um, yeah. You know, there's been some news about the lawsuits. There, Those are moving forward. So I, I have a feeling that before we kick off the next season, there'll be something more definitive out there on that. I think there's a lot of negotiating going on right now. So, um, all right. Uh, they, next, they, they, go ahead. I was going to say they just were sent to mediation like this week. Or yeah, the, you know, yeah. So it's, I'd love that. It'd be great if there was some finality to that because we all already kind of know where this is going. It's going to end up being a big three. ACC will be picked apart. Hopefully, that's when the 2027 look in for Brett Yormark that he tried to slide in there at the the only power of negotiation we really had as a Big 12 conference came in. And once that's pulled apart, maybe our shares go up because, well, there's one less mouth. There's what, 19 percent less mouths to feed uh, or what that was their percentage or something like that. So I, I just yeah, it's. It'd be great for this to be finalized. I still think it's going to take. A well, couple of years I would say play. if we get Miami, that might be the case. But they did it on they did it on playoff last ten years uh, of playoff participation, right? So nobody in the ACC okay. outside of FSU and Clemson participated that I can recall. Yeah. So, so that thing. would all go away, and the and the shares wouldn't go up unless they demoted some of those to G five, like they did for the Pac twelve. I, I I understand how they did it as a leverage and negotiation tactic, but if those two aren't there, are you saying the rest of the Big 12 wouldn't have made a playoff? Like, see, I, I, it's kind of playing around with statistics and numbers, and I understand. Well, technically, that. technically, they didn't count Cincinnati's. They, they even went further than that. They didn't count Cincinnati's. And for the SEC, they also did not count Texas and Oklahoma. So they said anybody – who was in the conference at the time within that 10 year span, they didn't give them the credit. They, if they left the league, they didn't give the league credit for those playoff appearances, but they also didn't give the new league uh, the credit for those playoff appearances either. But so basically like Oklahoma's was just didn't count toward yeah. anybody's calculation. So, so we would have, yeah, but what, that's, we would have gotten Baylor or, or not Baylor um, TCU. We would have gotten credit yeah. for TCU, and I think that's it. But that's the thing. You so you're saying that if those two aren't in this conference, that there would be no one from this conference other than TCU getting in there. I I just I I don't like the math that they were trying to play. But no, again, they did it on past performance. The trying, yeah. They did it on past performance. But as you alluded to. Uh, and I was getting ready to talk about the article by Ross yeah. Dellinger. There was a lot of stuff in there. And one of the things that was mentioned uh, was, uh, you know, your, your mark was not happy with how the distributions went, uh, but he did uh, get them to agree to a 2027 look in in case there was more realignment and based on performance. So they can say, <laughs> well, yeah. And they can say, Wait. they. I get that, but they can say, Let's say, um, you know, in a in a 12 team playoff, now we've got, uh, you know, we're going to have a big 12 representative every year, no matter what. It's going to even some of that out. But the the um, the play ins, right, the the what do you call it when when you're not an automatic qualifier for the playoff, um, the plus seven. But I know what you say. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So at basically, large. at large, at large, at large. Yeah. yeah, we all got it at the same time. So the at large bids, you know, we all know that the vast majority of them are going to go SEC, Big Ten anyway. But there's still the ability to kind of balance that out, right? But if there are less teams, as you said, that you know, after the ACC implodes, and it's interesting that he chose 2027 for that because that's not that far away. Um, you know, if some of those teams get relegated essentially to uh, G5 status, then, um, you know, that pot, that overall pot that's left over that's not claimed will be bigger. And I'm wondering if they just, um, you know, may divvy up the same percentages, right? And just, 
divvy up the percentage that the ACC would have had by the percentages that they already established, and then the pocket's a little bit bigger. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or if the teams that you know do go to the Big Ten or the SEC and the Big 12, they take those shares with them, and then they split up the rest. You know, I, I don't know how they're going to do that, but uh, that's a that's a big part of it. So um, go ahead, Josh. Nope. Well, I, if you want to talk about that article, that was kind of where I think we were going. Yeah, that was the next thing on the list. So um, Ross Dellinger put out a really, really, really good article. Actually, today, I believe he put it out. It gave us a, a preview of the mechanics of what was going on in 2022 as the playoff discussions were happening, right? So if you remember in the Wayback Machine, which was only not even two years ago, uh, there was this thing called the Alliance. And the Alliance was the uh, the Big Ten, the ACC, and the now defunct Pac-12. And uh, this was when the SEC was really pushing to go to a 12-team playoff, and the Alliance put a stop to it. And these negotiations were actually going on, and they were having these conversations. The morning that Georgia and Alabama played in the playoff uh, championship and Georgia won, um, they were having that conversation. The commissioners of, of the various conferences were having that conversation and um, they didn't want to move it forward. And, and Sankey was so mad um, that they weren't moving it forward that he actually walked out of the meeting and nobody could, uh, nobody could believe it. Right. Everybody was trying to put up a front and they were basically overplaying their hand. And Sankey said, all right, well, if you're doing that then I'm walking out, so then fast forward. The, and at that time, one of the challenges that, that actually would have been in the Big 12's favor was the revenue distribution was more like what it existed today, which is 80% evenly distributed to the Power 5 conferences, right? With 19% going to the G5 and then some independents. What ended up happening now is those revenue splits, as we were just talking about, have changed based on the number of uh, of the past performance in the playoff and participation therein. So it actually put us as the Big 12 in a worse uh, situation. We sided with the SEC. And, I, and I'm telling you, I told you guys this then, if you listen to Nightline, I feel like, you know, obviously the Big 10 was not going to get left out because of the brands that they have, right? But the Alliance members, all of a sudden the Pac-12 has gone and the ACC is on the brink. Thank goodness the Big 12 uh, sided with the SEC on this particular issue, right? Because I think that earned us brownie points and why we may be the third lead. Now, going further, now the Big 12 is going to make about 12 to 14 million uh, per team. Um, at that time, Sankey said in, in, in this article, he said that there was serious consideration. He was not just, and to use another word, bloviating. Josh, you forgot to put our thread up. Uh, uh, you know, but revisiting that word bloviating. He wasn't just bloviating. He he was serious uh, about splitting uh, with the current power structure. Um, thank goodness that didn't happen. Um, the... Um, the advisory board, now what it... What all of these changes did right before they went into this most uh, this most recent 12 team playoff negotiation, which was February 2nd, um, the joint there was a joint advisory board that was formed by the SEC and the Big Ten, which now represents 61 of the 88 last AP associated poll champs. M they went in together, the Big Big Ten and the SEC went in with a united front, and their conversation was, hey, we bring them the most to the table, so we should get most out of uh, that. They also brought up the aforementioned NIL burden uh, for the suit that's going to be coming out. And uh, even then, Sankey quoted that he didn't view them having to stay together. Everybody went into that meeting saying we have to stay together. He said that they didn't have to stay together. So it was this close to actually having a separation. We were all talking about it. We were all speculating about it. But, you know, we didn't think it had to happen that quickly. But it could have very easily been another division for the SEC and the Big Ten, which would have been really, really interesting. Now, uh, some of these um, 
some of these, uh, a lot of these analysts that are working toward with the um, with the TV networks and things and the conferences to figure out what TV value is. The latest thing that they're coming out with is that they they think that there's going to be two 24 leagues and uh, two 24 member leagues and one 20 team super conference league, uh, which would mean that there would be 64 teams. Now there are currently 70 some teams. Well, we eliminated what two basically and relegated two so far. So I think it was 72, it was it 78 teams that were in the P5. I think, I think it was so. something like 78 teams. So we lost two, right? So let's say it's 76. We still got to get to 64. So this really is going to be an arms race, if this is true, for the Big 12 and the ACC. And I think what you're seeing right now is the opening shots by FSU and Clemson um, and that the decision's already been made which one to ax. And I think it's going to be the ACC. So it's it's really interesting stuff. It's actually it, all of this moved pretty rapidly, if you think about it. This is all within a year and a half. Um, and I still think it's going to end up to be two. I, I don't think they have enough for the TV contracts to be able to do that. And I, I think I, there's, if it was only the two, there'd be, you'd be losing 49.1 million fans. No, I think they're going to take some, I think they're going, ultimately, I think what's going to happen is it's going to become two conferences. I think they're going to try to cherry pick the best of the ACC, the Big Ten and the SEC. And then cherry pick the best of the Big 12. I think that's ultimately what they're going to do. I think they could try to weed out some of the SEC or Big 10 teams, but I think those brands are kind of big. Um, yeah, but I think it's going to be two conferences. Or even if it's one conference, I think they're going to get the 64 teams somehow. It's going to be a two six two thirty two. However you want to do it. It's 64 teams, however you want to split it. 232 team divisions is what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, I, I think they're going to split it to 64 teams. I think it's going to be 64 power team super conference. How they get there and what they call it, I don't know. I, I think we're going to do away with, like, Pac-12 and SEC. I think it's just going to – Well, the Pac-12 is already gone. We, th- yeah, that's but I mean, like, just like the the, the the regional titles that we have, I think they're going to do away with it because the Big Ten isn't Southern California. You know, that, that's never been the case. That's not – but they're in the Big Ten. I just think they're not going to call it that anymore. I think right. they're going to try to get so, the best. So I wasn't planning on going down this road, but right now, with everything that we know right now, is UCF in the 64? Can I, before we go there, I, I'm just curious. and I'm sorry if you said it, Roger. Um, I well, said a lot, so I may not. <laughs> you I may said, not I even said, know if you said it after after yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Um, it's, the, uh, the, how did they get to 64 again? What was the – Point. Why, why, why do two things have 24 and uh, another one have 20? I, I, what, so what, this is, this is the, numbers come from? Th- this, this is coming from, um, there's, there's several different advisory, um, Layouts. companies that are out there. Right. So, uh, that are independents. Right. And one of them was one of the ones that, uh, na- there's navigate and, uh, it starts with a B. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but anyway, there's there's multiple different companies out there that advise and say, okay, how do you optimize? They advise both. They work with the TV networks and they work with the conferences to maximize their conference revenue, right? And these guys are in the know. They're in the middle of the negotiations with the conferences and the ESPN and Fox and everybody else that's involved. And they are now saying that they are predicting that it will be a 64 team with two 24 team leagues and one 20 team league. And, and, and are they saying those numbers because they've identified all 64 teams and we just are just guessing who's in the 64? Or are they saying that because of some sort of regionality or just? No, they're they're saying based on the metrics and the dollars involved that the that what they're predicting for it to happen and what would be the most revenue would be 64 total. And the way to get there would be two 24 team leagues with the Big Ten and the SEC being going to 24, and then the Big 12 more, most likely going to 20 teams. So if you, it'll either be the, the Big 12 or the ACC, more likely the Big 12, because uh, 
the the ACC does represent more fans today, but they also have more schools. Um, and um, yeah, they also have smaller fan bases, even than what we do in the Big 12 uh, per school in the ACC than what we do. So the idea is, is that they will pick from the ACC, consolidate them in the Big 12, and there'll be two, there'll be three super conferences with obviously the SEC and the Big 10 having a higher share of those revenue dollars, but an average of around $50 million per team uh, in TV revenue uh, in that third, uh, that third bucket. That so third so bucket. Here, here, here's my, here's my thing. Like why, if you're the SEC and Big 10, why would you just cherry pick from the ACC and let the Big 12 have the rest when you could cherry pick from the ACC, cherry pick from the Big 12 and take the best of the rest? And well, just take the rest of the revenue. Like why even keep well, the Big 12? Think, think about it. So they've already kind of cherry picked the Big 12. They they cher- they pulled apart the Pac-12. They took the they took uh Texas and OU, right? And these are these are things that are not easy. You've got things to negotiate. It's not just like a drop of a hat. You got to negotiate buyouts. You got to get people on schedules. You got to do all that stuff. So it's going to take some time to do that. Now, if the ACC completely falls apart, the next two on the, on the horizon, obviously, is Clemson and FSU, right? Um, and and again, not everybody got full shares, right? So think about the difference even between what Oregon got versus what Washington got. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, versus what USC got versus what UCLA got. Plus, you've got the states to deal with. Uh, you know, although the state of California you know, didn't stop it like uh, uh, like they were hoping, right? Um, but they did get their pound of flesh for the remaining schools uh, from that for the state university system. So those are all negotiations that have to happen each time some of these schools leave. Now, if you look at the Big 12 versus the ACC, if the ACC comes apart at the seams, which one is the easier one to start pulling schools from? Oh, right. of the ACC. And, and what are the what are the next biggest brands that are up? They're in the ACC. You've got the FSU, FSU, Clemson. Let's assume they're gone. You've got Virginia uh, and North Carolina. Those are the next two up. Where, are okay. we talking strictly football? Just to make sure that uh, these are all football driven decisions. Okay. Yeah. Then it okay. so be so probably UM and Vir- my Virginia. Uh, it would definitely would not be UM. It would be Virginia and, and UNC would be the next two. Um, then, then it, what? I don't. What is Virginia? Virginia, Basketball. you know, like Virginia well, is not, not a just, football. We're talking about fan base sizes and TV revenue dollars. Miami do, has not. Yeah, you look I, at their. I, stadium, I don't know about the revenue. Miami. Miami does not have the butts and seats. They're a very fickle fan base and okay. they're viewing as far as their, the people, the number of people that are viewing their games comparatively speaking has been really low and they've hurt themselves because they haven't done anything for a decade. So, you know, now that they're looking at all of these things, that that's what they're looking. And the other part is all the other revenue sports. So North Carolina, for example, does really good in the other revenue sports. Virginia does really good in, uh, or Olympic sports. And you remember the the Big Ten specifically likes that. Um, and then it's the school size and the research dollars. Miami does not draw in any research dollars. Right? They have they're a private school. They're a small school. They're not out there competing. They may bring some in. I assume they do. Right? Especially on the medical side because that's kind of what they're known for is that in international relations. But they're not like a UCF or uh, or North Carolina. That's a large public university that's going to be bringing state uh, research dollars in. So those are all things that are being considered. Would, would and, you think Duke? Why, why wouldn't Duke come up in those conversations over Virginia? In my opinion, over Virginia because they have a. And I'm just going to say this this way: we're e for everyone. They have a doo doo football history. Uh, recently, yes, they beat us in the. Two years in a row, right? <laughs> but, they, but, but way more huh? Virginia over the last five years. But like, I, that's like, I'm just trying to. Even when I was in school, I don't remember Virginia being this powerhouse football. Now, 
It, not. Duke was horrible. I'm not gonna lie. Duke was horrible. But the bas- if we're talking the rest of the sports, that basketball brand carries itself. Yeah, you said the word recently when you talked about Duke football, but they've been ranked way more than Virginia in the last five years. I, I don't know the recent history. Virginia is horrible on, compared hold to on, Duke. Hold on, hold on. We're talking ten years. Duke has done good in the last two or three years. That's it. Right. On top of that, I don't know if you've ever been to their campus, but I have. And mm-hmm. Duke Stadium is like it's thirty-two to thirty-five thousand. Right, that's smaller than ours, and they don't fill it. Oh yeah, Virginia, on the other hand, I think is somewhere fifty-five to sixty-five thousand, and they fill it. But if you the, were to the fan the base program. size and the viewing numbers are just completely different. The only thing Duke has for viewing numbers is basketball. That's it. But they I, do I'm really saying, well. so if if we're gonna choose, like, why would you choose Virginia? They're not really bringing anything to football. That's what they I are. Like. They're bringing fan base and uh, the the size of the uh, the size of the fan base. They're bringing in uh, butts and seats. How many people are viewing them on TV? And they are the school for the DMV. Oh, I mean, yeah, I guess They're more so than Virginia Tech, huh? Just Virginia like- Tech and Virginia are about the same, but Virginia Tech isn't worth as much uh, uh, academically as what uh, Virginia is. And North Carolina is a, is a very highly ranked. I know school. North Carolina definitely is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I have no qualms with North Carolina. I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't see the Virginia per se as a needle mover, in my opinion. Like, if they're not really like, yeah, they add value in a sense, but to me, that's like adding. That's like Mississippi State. That's like Vanderbilt. Like these guys really aren't competing. In they're prestigious. The yeah, they're prestigious. They're prestigious universities that are yeah. high, t- highly ranked that bring a lot of research dollars in. That's, and those that's a big are, 10. Okay, so that's what the, – yeah, that's a Big Ten school. That's how I saw yeah. Duke. If, if Duke were to come, I'd see them more Big Ten than SEC. Like, that's how I'd see it, you know, but I, I don't well, know. Welcome well, right. to ACC talk so, with so – back, so back, back to the original question. Is UCF in that 64 today, yes or no? I personal I personally think that that UCF is for all the reasons why they're in the Big 12 right now. Like the reasons why we're in the Big 12 right now is cuz we we reside in a large market, we're an up and coming athletic program that has had a lot of relevance in the last decade plus and um and we have a young alumni base that is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the fans are, are, are I think there were even viewed nationally. I would imagine in these types of conversations, while we're still probably viewed as, you know, that team that claimed the national championship or whatever you want to, those, those high elites want to call us. But like, I, 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 I think we're viewed equally as that that kind of team or i should say that fan base alumni base the the team the athletic program that is very much on the rise and you would rather have them in the club as opposed to outside of the club because the the benefit that ucf has in the 64 i think outweighs like any downside that they would have from being in there I just, right. I just don't, I don't think there's enough reasons to keep us out, and and it is obviously a biased, you know, opinion. But like, I just think the main re, the main reasons why we were allowed in in the first place, like it, it, it essentially applies to this expansion as well. To your point, Ben, I think that we are one of the teams that was promoted but accepted more so yeah. than some of the other teams were especially like when you look at how smu was treated you know um, we we i i feel like we were we are looked at as a legitimate ad and a value add to the conference where some of the other schools weren't houston now you know they're a basketball ad which is good for the big 12 but if you added try to add houston anywhere else even when we were talking about 2016 supposedly they were ranked below us and that was a Texas centric conference at that time. So um, I, I just feel nationally, we've just kind of been embraced in a way that uh, yes. a lot of the other new ads just haven't. Um, and like BYU and Cincinnati have been around a really, really long time. BYU is always going to have their place. 
uh, but they're not looked at as like they're ever going to break through that ceiling. Um, and I think Cincinnati's just kind of looked at, okay, they, they're not, they're not ever going to be a consistently good team where I think UCF, I feel like has that potential and thus has been accepted as a worthy P5 ad. That's, that's just how I look at it and the narrative, both in the media and with the fans, um, you know, that, that I've interacted with or seen, whether it be Reddit or anywhere else, they all, uh, they all seem to accept UCF as legitimate. Yeah. I think Uh, we're also, you know, I think to our benefit, Florida and, and FSU haven't kind of solidified themselves as like the just the brand in Florida, whereas, you know, you talk about Houston. They're never going to eclipse Texas. Right. They're never going to eclipse a and You talk about Cincinnati. They'll never eclipse Ohio State. You know, that those schools that they're trying to fight with, they'll never do it. Like, it could be 100 They have years. a ceiling. Yeah. Whereas I don't think – people hold Florida and Florida state in the regard of a Texas in the regard of Ohio state. I think it's in a tier or maybe even two below, which I think brings us closer, which allows us to like, I think we're, we're kind of in that same realm. If you want to say FSU and Florida better, like I have no qualms. I disagree, but I don't think it's some huge gap. Like it might've been 15 years ago. You know, I I think that's the thing. Yeah, I think on that same line of thinking, though, Trey, I think that we have the benefit in Florida versus those those states that you just talked about, where we actually have what what in the past was an established big three. Yeah. And what and what we have done over the last decade plus at UCF is we have we have continued to rise consistently to use your word, Roger, like consistently throughout like all aspects of our athletic program and our university yeah. and Miami has, has, has is flat at best declining is probably more likely. And because we were able to, it actually isn't much about FSU and Florida because they're, they're nationally accepted, but like, because we're, we're like, now in the big three in the sense that we've kind of passed Miami already Miami and, out of that, that and it looks like for the future we're just going to continue to put some distance between the two of us it's like we're in a we're in a club that's important in our own state so you, it, you, nationally you can start to wrap your head around like yeah. they're they're kind of in the club in general you know nationally because yeah. we've done it in our own state and because I because Miami is just I mean they fall I, off I, the I, th- I think that, you know, we we underachieved based on our own expectations. And we talked about expectations both during both basketball and football season. Right. Um, but ultimately, I think nationally, the viewing point is we didn't get embarrassed. We stepped right into yeah. a P5 conference and we competed in basketball, even though none of us were expecting that. But we were relevant throughout the year, um, you know, football. It was touch and go there for a while. There were some weird ones like Baylor, right? But uh, but we were we were there uh, and were respected football wise. You know what I mean? Uh, and I do still think we have some uh, from those 2017, 2018, 2019 teams. We're we're looked at as good in football, right? Uh, and uh, and we haven't embarrassed ourselves yet. Although you know, I was kind of embarrassed during the military bowl against Duke, but. You know, um, I was there for that. But, you know, outside of that, I think from our internal expectations versus external expectations, I think nationally, we're like, okay, they can handle this. They moved up. They didn't get embarrassed. And things like, you know, you talk about Gus Malzahn on the hot seat and all that stuff that that has been mentioned in a few games past. Uh, Trey, you were talking about that. Things like us being so high in the recruiting rankings and all of that other stuff were looked at as legitimate, where... Miami has been the off-season champs for so long in <laughs> recruiting and have done nothing with it. There, it's almost turned into a meme for them, in that yeah. that's it's a negative branding connotation because hey, they're going to throw money at everybody, but they're going to they're not going to achieve anything during the season. So I, I I do think that that's the case, and it's also helped with FSU. You know, for a while there, they were mediocre uh, as well. So all right, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I yeah, at, at this point at this point I, I don't even know what to think anymore. I, I'm not even gonna lie. I, I real I really don't. 
it everything is so crazy on monks football i i really i got nothing more to say i'm gonna say, right. i'm gonna stop it right there gosh yes or no Is UCF a fringe? Uh, Are they a top sixty? I want to say yes. I want to say yes, but I've been a fan and since the nineties, the the late nineties, and I see where this thing has happened for us. Right? I've seen us like get the rug pulled out from under us so many times. Uh, Trey should have been in a in a CFP uh, playoff, but no. All right. Uh, you know, Alan. It, it, the, the next oh, year when so we were undefeated. I thought you didn't. You said you didn't have anything to say about it. You know, you well, you, thoughts, you right? goaded me. Keep going. <laughs> you goaded me. Here's the thing. Uh, so the UCF fan of me from the 90s and 2000s, uh, and I'd say early 2010s, like the the one the one that saw us beat Marshall <laughs> and a 17 game losing streak is like no. That they're not going to let us in, but we see little glimpses, and those little glimpses look good. You know, it, Trey was on on one of those teams, um, which didn't look good a couple of years earlier, but you need that time to grow, right? Uh, even the even the year before in that curable, but we've seen glimpses that relatively recently, like just shellacking Oklahoma State. So I, I think. I think the answer should be yes, but the old school UCF fan in me is like, hey, here it comes again. We're just going to get the rug pulled out from under them. Uh, so the answer, it should be yes. All right. But we'll your see what happens. Yes or no? Today, right now, are they included? Yes or no? Should be. I didn't say yes. should be. Yes or no. Those are, it's binary, Josh. <laughs> yes. Okay, there yes. we go. Yes, for the question. <laughs> All right, Alan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think they, if the NCAA or whatever, who the powers be that are smart, yeah, they would include an up and coming school that has so much upside and sleeping um, giant. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, yeah, I think they are included. I mean, there's so many useless Power Five programs that are just in there because they were in the right location at the right time 100 years ago or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think UCF is going to be included in the big time in some way, shape, or form. Like, I don't – I think – when I think of the big time, I think of just that they can play for the main national championship. So, yes, I think whatever that future looks like, they'll be in – they'll be eligible to play for the top prize in college football whenever that case – whenever that time comes. See, that, right. I can, that I can agree to. I think I, I think well, that wasn't that, that wasn't the question, Josh. I know. So, I know. But that I can. But yeah, my to. answer is yes to your original question. But that's yeah. that's what I would look at is maybe the money isn't going to be the same as Alabama. But if you're if you're able and can realistically get into the top prize, then that's what matters most. Well, All I right. So, well, hold on, hold on one moment. Maybe that's part of the other side of what this all in for this coming year might be, too, because I know it's probably Gus Malzahn going, well, you know, if we do really well, there's potential other opportunities, right? Uh, maybe part of it and the nil and all that on top of everything else is if we get a sniff or a possibility of getting close to a playoff now then that, you know, we have this one or two or maybe three years to like really solidify. It's not just 2013. It's not just 2017. It's 2024 too. And you can't keep us out. Maybe it's more, maybe that's part of where all this push is going. All right. So um, I'm going to answer this and I'm going to answer this simply today. No. The only reason we'd be included is if they, didn't shuffle if they if they shuffled the deck and they picked the teams today i would say no if they were picking them from the acc and the big 12 if they merged the best of the acc that's left over with the big 12 then yes obviously we'd be included but if they were just picking 64 today we would not be included i do however to your point josh and this was the point i was going to make is that we are now on the clock to continue that brand building right so for me um we are the middle of the middle of the p5 if that makes any mm -hmm. sense our job is to get to the top of the middle of the p5 
in the ensuing years. And if we do that, I think we would be included. Today, right. no, we don't. Today, no. If that question was 64 teams today, no, I don't think we'd be in the we'd be picked in the draft. And that so point you think is these next few years are like this upcoming year and the next year are important? Yes, it's prove it prove it years. If realignment, so, if if let's say let's say the FSU and Clemson situations figured out by this next football season. We have probably two more football seasons before we come up in the draft and could potentially be be done that way. However, okay. I do agree that it's not that easy. So they're they're just going to merge the leftover ACC teams into the Big 12 to get to that 20 in the interim step. So I think within 10 years that may change again. Um, but I think so for the short term, I think we're safe. Uh, but long term, we've got some work to do to make sure we're the top of the middle of the pack consistently. And and that that point is based in the assumption that the at the current SEC and Big Ten schools are completely safe. So the only schools that are not safe in this new line of thinking are ACC and Big 12 schools. Is that opinion based in that assumption? Correct. Because yeah. if we if we blew it all up, right, and we just said, right. hey, we start from scratch. Hey, Vanderbilt, you're not there, bro. I mean, Northwestern. Uh, Wake Forest, I mean, it's got North, so many. Wake yeah. Forest, Northwestern. Um, uh, Duke might be included for for basketball, but, you know, that that would be the only thing there. Uh, you know, would Baylor be included? Probably not. Probably Small not. school, not a big fan base, you know, whatever. They've done well with what they've had recently, but they were they were bad for a very long time. BYU, probably included. Cincinnati, borderline, right? West Virginia, probably included, but they're sliding down the scale too because yeah. their academics are not great. And, uh, you know, um, their athletics, it's kind of like the – like West Virginia to me – although we haven't done well against them lately, right? But West Virginia to me is kind of like what ECU was when we joined in Conference USA, right? They were coming off great years, um, but as Conference U USA gave way to the a AC, ECU got left behind and their, their program's kind of falling apart. I see that future for West Virginia. So, um, you know, from the ACC schools, like I said, you think about Wake Forest, nope. You think about... Uh, uh, even on the big, big 10, big 10, Purdue, is that really going to make it? No, they've got great baseball, but are they going to make it? Probably not. Well, you know, so it's really Western, probably not. Maybe chip game. So, so here's the homework. Why don't you guys, if you blew it up, right, do your ranking of 64 teams that you would pick within a draft for next week and then say just football or just entirety, just, just entire athletic departments, right? Uh, pick I the, the homework here. Pick the pick the sixty four, and then tell me again next week if if you picked it that way, would you see honestly would UCF be included today as it stands today or not? I'm interested to hear what your answers are. All right, I'm going to save the su super league that was uh, floated. That was a real proposition that was including North Carolina. Uh, the, the AD for North Carolina was behind it. I'm going to save that for next week in that scenario it'd be 80 teams and UCF with it as a permanent member. So continuing that power status. So we'll talk about that a little next week. Let's move on to basketball. We did have some Wait, one question really quickly though. So just to make sure one more thing, Ben, one more these thing. Next, <laughs> these, these next few seasons for football, like on a scale of one to 10 of importance, how important are they? Like the next two years, two years. Uh, I mean, with 2027 right around the corner, what Josh is saying is probably the well, it depends if you're talking about for the conference or for UCF. If you're talking about UCF. for the conference, is extremely important, right? I'd, I'd say a nine, right? Uh, for for UCF, I'd say it's probably about a seven. We we want like just like standing goal. within, like, if, if these next few years of football success determine whether we're you know a lot top 64 or fall out. Like, do you think that's like a nine? That's a ten. If that's the if that's the scenario you're painting, Gus Malzahn on the hot seat, baby. That's what I heard. <laughs> Wait, what? Whoa, whoa! You heard? That's that's, that's what I, that's what you're telling me. 
Is that yeah. what you're saying? If it's a 10 of importance, if it's a ten yeah. of importance that's well, like, that's exactly. like I said, I don't think that timing is right now. I think we still got two or three years to kind of prove it um, for UCF. But you painted a very specific scenario. I think that's more important for the conference for the 2027 year. Because like I said, if, if the ACC is going to lose Clemson and FSU, that's going to happen. And it does happen before the football season that's announced. There's going to be a year or two before they get uh, turned over and, and go to their new homes, right? And then you've got Virginia Tech, North Carolina, and everything else. After they leave, then we're on the clock. So that's really four, like I said, within four four to five years, I think, is where we've got to kind of pull a we year that and establish ourselves okay. as kind of the top tier of the Big 12. Gotcha. Makes sense. Does that makes sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, now that Ben's done with his one more thing, uh, Ben, I'm going to turn the Please. mic over. To, I know I'm joking. I'm joking. Cause it's usually you who does that. Uh, all right. So you've even got your own banner for that. Um, all right. So I'm going to turn it over to you and talk a little bit about uh, this new basketball transfer. We had some good news in basketball. Um, uh, we had some good news in basketball. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about Keyshawn Hall? Yeah. A few weeks ago, we, you know, we were the sky is falling because we talked we had nothing to talk about but transfers out but that was the that was the only thing that we could talk about because it wasn't the transfer portal hadn't officially opened uh for this portion of the year which is this is you know you get some you get a decent amount of football players to talk about but certainly basketball it's 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 the hottest transfer portal season since it follows after march madness is over and so um, we're starting to gain some players in the portal and Keyshawn Hall, uh, is our latest, um, transfer portal get. He is a six foot eight, 250 pound guard from, uh, George Mason. He started out his, uh, his freshman season at UNLV. Uh, he was a pretty highly recruited player, I believe. Um, but, um, he started out at UNLV. He played in a decent amount of games. He averaged about 10 minutes a game at UNLV, um, but he decided for whatever reason to transfer to George Mason, probably just uh, saw some opportunity to play in a certain system or just be able to get more playing time in general. And he bumped that up to, not only did he bump that up to 30 minutes a game as a sophomore at George Mason, but like basically every statistical category, he doubled and tripled his averages um he went from you know uh, averaging five and a half points at unlv to 16 and a half uh, 16.6 points at george mason um one of the things that really intrigued me about his stats is that um he averaged over eight rebounds a game you know as a as a guy that kind of plays that two or three spot in the offense. Um, he's somebody who really likes to mix it up. I mean, eight rebounds a game is kind of a big deal. I mean, especially in college basketball, just to give you context. I mean, when you think about some of the rebounds that we were getting, you know, some of the rebounders on our team, I should say some of the big men on our team, you know, Diallo led our, led our UCF team um, last season with 5.6 rebounds a game last year. And so, um, and, and, and Keyshawn Hall averaged over eight rebounds from the guard spot, um, along with over 16 points. He also shot 35% from the three point line. He was somebody that when he entered the transfer portal, uh, after his sophomore season at George Mason was very, very highly regarded, uh, very highly recruited. He wound up choosing UCF over Arkansas, USC and Michigan state. Those are all pretty high level programs. Um, and so, you know, with Cal being at Arkansas right now, and then I, he was really, it seemed to be really kind of leaning towards USC and he wound up choosing UCF. Um, and so he could, he could be an immediate impact player for us. Um, you know, it's a, as we've, as we've talked about a lot over the last couple of weeks and on this show, I mean, you, you don't know exactly how, um, you know, a player's skill set is going to is going to translate uh, from one program to the next. But um, as far as not only statistically, but just looking at some of his highlight reels, um, he's an impressive player. And so hopefully he's an impressive player for UCF. 
Awesome. So, um, you know, one of the things we talked about before we started the show, we've got a lot of guards kind of lined up, right? We got Mike Williams, we got DJ, we got Sellers. Um, I, I thought we would see him as a three. What's your assessment on on how he fits into the rotation as it's con- constructed today? Yeah, I think that he's definitely going to fit into that that three spot. Maybe even a maybe even some sort of like you know four guard lineup and have him in the four spot. Um, you know, if you're going going a smaller lineup, especially his desire to mix it up in the paint, I really think that. Um, he'll allow some versatility in um, matchups and lineups for, for, for coach Dawkins to kind of take advantage of certain, you know, hopefully matchup problems that he could create. But yeah, I could see him more than likely just in general being in that three spot if he was in a starting lineup. Um, And, and we'll, we'll see in the next couple of weeks here um, who else we can acquire in the transfer portal. Cause obviously we are, rather thin on the front line when it comes to six players yeah we had six players dude well yeah we we had six players at one point but the but but also it's just that it's just a matter to me it's it i'm really curious to see and you just mentioned it roger we've we've you know we're not we're not looking too bad from a guard standpoint going into next season so far um but the you know the the amount of you know holes that we have not filled um, on the on the front le- on the front line. I mean, the big man department needs to needs to certainly uh, um, we need to acquire some guys that can mix it up down low. So um, we'll have to see. It's kind of like the to me, it's like we're a little bit worried about depth at wide receiver and on the football team, and we're certainly worried about depth at the forward and center position uh, on the basketball team. I think that's where we're, we need to really focus all of our energy on moving forward. Yeah, that was, uh, it's certainly interesting too, uh, because we did up our NIL game uh, this off season. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of quality of a player that we can, we can attract and hopefully, um, you know, we're not, we're not going to end up kind of like we did last year where Joey Hart left and we're trying to backfill some of those players at the last minute. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, TCU lost a player to the portal this week, uh, this past. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was hardly there. Right. I, 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 I I don't know exactly what happened there, but CJ Walker, yeah. Decided to decommit to TCU a week after he committed to them. So yeah, sounds like the uh, McDonald's bag didn't contain the Big Mac, so it might have had a uh, cheeseburger, no pickles. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm sure he's going to get paid by some program, and that's that's fine. Uh, it'd be it'd be interesting to see if all of a sudden that just circles back right to UCF. I, I don't. Uh, that's that's with no inside knowledge whatsoever. But it would be rather interesting if CJ what's, decided what, to finish out at UCF. What's interesting for me is, uh, you know. This is his bag year. I mean, he's been injured quite a sure. bit, and you don't know. You know, they CJ has twice gone and got evaluated for the draft, and this season was not what he hoped it would be. I mean, he played well and he showed a lot, a lot of different things, but again, was injured. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I, I feel like he tries to maximize his bag year this year, um, yeah, and. Uh, because uh, I would bet that he was told that he's probably going to go to the Euro League or something like that um, and not make the NBA draft, unfortunately. Whereas before, if you remember a couple of years ago, he was uh, he was listed pretty high on people's draft boards. Yeah, coming out of high school, he was a five-star recruit. He was, he was considered to be a one-and-done when he went to Oregon, and it just never worked out, never materialized for that. Uh, that type of level of player that you needed to be to make the NBA draft, but it's certainly a five-star recruit coming out of high school. So, so yeah, we'll have to see what, what happens there, but um, uh, yeah, so, you know, a, we'll little, a little bit of good news this week. Uh, we did miss on um, uh, Jalen Sellers was heavily recruiting his ball state uh, uh, compatriot that played on the right. team that he came from. Um, who transferred somewhere else. So uh, Johnny Dawkins, I mean, you, you see it all the time. He's he's definitely putting our name in the hat for everything. And it's still interesting because that contract issue hasn't, 
uh, <laughs> publicly been resolved. So right. uh, it's it's interesting to see how this season will go. All right. Um, that's it for basketball this week. So uh, let's talk a little UCF baseball. Trey, do you want to talk about baseball this week? We all know that uh, you've got a heater, oh, so oh. you have – well, you talk about but baseball. So far, You're a big baseball oh, fan. I mean, I mean, from what I know, from what you got, I didn't really watch too much baseball this weekend because I was watching the softball. All right, so that's me. Um, yeah, so yeah, let Josh do it. I'll talk about softball. All Sadly. right, Josh. Ugh. Ugh, softball is tough too. Well, baseball, yeah. you know, this week in baseball was like really amazing for two out of three games. And then one game. Home run derby. One game was like that was we didn't even do text talk and my text talk was all about that like how we had like an inning or so to get from six to eight home runs to tie the record of home runs in a game and amazingly we did it I think it was just one inning we had to do it and I watched a little bit more of those last two games because I was uh, solo parenting this weekend. And so I got to watch a movie with my daughter. That was kind of cool. Um, we also then turned on the softball game, but we'll, we'll go back to that. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so on, fr on Friday, I didn't have a chance to take a look. And I'm, what I usually do, I go to all the UCF stuff that all of you go to, all of the listeners go to, and I was not a single dad. Come on. <laughs> no, my, my wife had a wonderful beach uh, vacation, which was awesome because she needed to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, I I go and I look at the score and it's a 2-0 shutout. And I go, what? Their picture, Central Michigan's pitcher pitched like 133 pitches. I think it was a complete game shutout. I mean, that just didn't had an eight sense. eight ERA coming into this game. By and yeah, way. seven point nine ERA, and and so that dropped us like seven RPI points, and it was it was not great. Uh, and then then like the cannons unleashed, and uh, I don't know what what was missing on Friday, but I think it was like was seventeen runs on on Saturday and twenty three on Sunday. It was a day lose. Twenty three so, to three. 20, yeah, it was a 20 point win. It was it was amazing. Like watching that game, you're like, this they they can't keep getting hit like over and over and over again, like four home runs in an inning, and it didn't stop there. So the baseball team minus I'll say that's why you play the game, right? There are some there's some all of us have probably either played in a sport or have watched someone play a sport where you're like, there's no way they're winning that game of uh, uh, fairly Dick Dickinson in the NCAA tournament, you know, a couple of years back. So there's a lot of, of Cinderella type of stories there that might've been just like the one-off game where we, it would have been nice to squeak out something, but nah, which is not great. Uh, well, it's, it's more than that, Josh. Uh, let's, let's be real. We, we dropped 27 to 27 on RPI. And the problem with that is yeah. not just that. It's the fact that the teams that we have left on the schedule are not uh, high RPI teams. And uh, some of the teams that we played that were higher RPI are now no longer RPI. Yeah. Uh, Texas dropped down into the 80s. The Cows got swept by uh, Rice or somebody this weekend. It was Rice. Uh, yeah. So, you know, their, their RPI is tanking. So... It's not just our performance, but yeah. it's also the potential that we have uh, for RPI teams that we have left on the schedule. And, you know, the, the big number typically for you to get into the postseason as an at-large is 40 wins. Um, so there's not a lot of room for error left after losing that game and dropping West Virginia. So uh, we went we went very quickly from it from potentially hosting to potentially not making the NCAAs unless we win the uh, yeah. unless we win the uh, Big Twelve conference. I I mean I know West Virginia uh, that 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 was all games. Horrible, yes, games. yes, I know. But I just the, my gut as much as I said earlier that the defeatist uh, UCF fan of me is like yeah yeah we were going to get the rug pulled out from us. I feel like this baseball team has. The with Sundin probably coming back. I think I read that um, in this coming series. I I think we have 
what it takes to make it to uh, the tournament, but we're going to be in Tallahassee or Gainesville or something. We're, we're not going to be in Orlando. We're unless. projecting, we're projecting uh, Gainesville, I think. But yeah. the crazy thing is, is Florida hasn't played all that great this, this season <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't well, get well, that. We won five but, straight against them. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listen, hey, that's what it is, you know. I, I, but I, I think that's definitely, unless we like go on a streak and win every single series and win the, tournament, the Big 12 tournament, yeah, it's probably not happening. O- on the, on the, on the hosting, I'm pretty certain that's not going to happen, but there's still a shot. But I still feel like we get to the tournament. Hopefully, I'm right. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, real quick, we're gonna do a. Uh, wow, I just realized um, Nobra had to leave a little early, and uh, he was not changing the um, the banners for our sections here. So <laughs> apparently, we're still pl- talking about UCF football talk. So we'll go <laughs> to college football updates real quick for the for the viewers. And we went through hoops <laughs> and we went through UCF baseball. And now let's go for a real quick uh, student re-education. And this week, something popped up that most students don't remember. And Nobra probably will miss out on this week and, until he listens back and edits the video. Um, but UCF did play the Moscow Bears in 1992 that came up. Uh, someone on Twitter put together a list that that was like the weirdest teams that uh, that uh, Big 12 teams have played. We did that if for the history buffs and most of you that uh, well, all the players now weren't weren't born in 92. Um, but that was after immediately after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, UCF did end up winning that game 42 to six. They were six and four that season. And the reason we played uh, the Moscow Bears was because Savannah State, uh, who was a team we used to play back then, <laughs> uh, actually couldn't make the game. So our makeup game at the Citrus Bowl was against the Moscow Bears, which we won 42 to 6. So as far as I know, we are the only team to beat Russia uh, in football. So America. All right. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Um, Alan does not have an oxymoronic stat of the week for us. Um, it's not football season. So um, <laughs> we're, we're going to leave that in there. Uh, or basketball. Or basketball. Or- he said basketball. Well, he he wrote in the show notes, it's not football season and (laughs) we don't have a boxing team. So uh, so he does not have a fun fact of the week. However, Josh is going to save us with his sometimes funny fact of the week. And we we are talking about the doldrums of relatively sportless uh, UCF. So I need to pull something out of the bag for this one. So here here's a question for you. this Roger lookalike Grammy award winning former UCF student is curating his own stage at Stagecoach this weekend. What is his name? A stage name is fine. Oh, former UCF student. Ooh. So I'm, I'm guessing he's the younger version of me. Um, Similar age. <laughs> Close. Really? Close. And heritage, actually. Is it chairman? Partially. Oh boy, just like me. All right, my doppelganger, who apparently is a lot more successful than I am, because I'm I'm doing this this podcast and not uh, uh, going on uh, doing the stagecoach. <laughs> as much as I love you guys, I, I I have no idea. I had some ideas of former uh, UCF uh, students that were musicians, but they're all younger than me, so I don't know. I'll have to pass on this one. I don't even have a guess. Anyone? Is it- uh, uh, stagecoach isn't just music, isn't isn't don't, like isn't there other acts at stagecoach or is it just music? I think it's mostly music. So if you're not familiar, stagecoach is like the country version of Coachella that mm. happens out in the Coachella Valley afterwards. Like, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Trey, you're a country guy. I'm definitely I just, a big. Country I just fan. know country will no take me home. That's about all our country. I <laughs> oh boy, you're I'm right. a huge country fan, but I didn't realize that a big or a you know even a semi big country star went to UCF. So, all right, Alan, we know you're a big country fan. Morgan Whalen. 
She's no, so no, but amazingly, there. still headlining stagecoach despite throwing chairs off balconies <laughs> in Nashville. No, I, I do like country. I, I didn't realize there was a big country star that went to UCF. No, no idea. All right. So this Stop is me. a little. This this is a little bit of an interesting thing because he's not traditionally known more for country music, although he's been at Stagecoach for four straight years. He's more known for electronic music. What is Tronic? His name, and his name is Diplo. Diplo. Oh, Diplo went to UCF. Like, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know that. that. He went to UCF when I went to UCF in 1997. He stayed here for like a semester or two. He was on WPRK, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, he then moved to Temple. So, yeah, he went to UCF at ni in 97. He was a DJ at WPRK at Rollins College um, and, I, and UCF. The reason you do that is because you have a radio station that plays jazz. And former DJs at radio stations... Don't want to spend two years before you get out of the newsroom like me. So I was going to be, I should have went to WPRK because I was a FCC licensed DJ in the nineties. Probably Diplo was too. Uh, and he moved to temple uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and he started DJing when he was about 20, but yeah, he was a UCF student for, I think a year or so. And he actually has talked about like uh, growing up and, and DJing at Rollins college and playing whatever the heck he wants. Cause no one was listening. <laughs> to him and, <laughs> and some other stuff too so yeah that's interesting because i like diplo and you know he does some collabos with skrillex well, and well, you know a few other people and, uh, and marshmallow and you know a bunch yeah. of folks in the edm scene so look uh, and if you look at his photos of him like 10 years ago or so you guys have a pretty similar appearance i'm not gonna lie it's, i it's, didn't know we looked alike I, I don't even know what he looks like to be honest so, i don't either like a, uh, no, he uh, he is. Is, I think he is also partially German, if I remember. That's part of his background too. Well, um, but like, Diplo I looked at was a little too close to Duplo, so I guess that makes sense. And, and for those that have German heritage and what know what Duplos are, they're they're super yummy. Yeah, <laughs> it's Thomas Wesley Pence. Uh, but yeah, I think he does have some German background in him as well. But anyway, yeah, I I. I'm shocked. Well, I tried to do a little switcheroo because he's been a stagecoach and he has he is an alter like a, a country um, ego, if you will, or whatever, called Thomas Wesley, which is his first middle name. So and he actually is curating uh, a, sh a whole area of stagecoach, which is really intriguing. <laughs> but, you know, Indio, California, Coachella, stagecoach, Diplo, former UCF student is hanging out there with Morgan Wallen. And Dwight Yoakam, Clint Black. I All guess right, so oh, okay. Post Malone's going to be there. So anyway, yeah. All right. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Diplo, uh, Meek Mill. Uh, you know, there, there's there there's actually a few people that have UCF ties. Uh, but when you said country, Cheryl Crow, I was thinking about a lot. Uh, or Plies, yeah, Plies. Meek uh, Mill. Me, me yeah, I was about to oh, search that. I didn't know that one. Well, he didn't go here, but he's a big uh, supporter of UCF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that 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 I do know. Also, we had Jose Jose who uh, uh, did some wrapping down in uh, R.I.P. for Jose. Jose. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, that was a that was a big lineman. Let me tell you, uh, yeah. you would not want to line up against him. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Josh. I I, I learned something this week uh, about. Ooh. Diplo. So that's awesome. I had no idea and you stumped the panel. So, um, all right. So let's go ahead and, and round everything out. But uh, before we do that, I'm going to let, since since Trey watched softball all, all weekend, I mean, there isn't anything really exciting to say, but what do you yeah. want to say about softball? <laughs> no, I mean, it's just up and down season, man. We, we play well against some teams and Baylor who, I mean, they're a below average team in the conference and we get swept. Uh, all we lost all the game by one run. We couldn't hit. Um, we had two great. runs all season. Uh, we had the pitching was all great. Series. We had all series. We had two runs. Yeah. That, the yep. hitting has been hit and miss. Uh, we yep. we went on a run where we had really good hitting, and then we ran into Baylor, and it did not work out so well. Yep. And next week we have uh this weekend we have Oklahoma. Um, they're not as great as they were, but you know when you are sixty one and one, 
there's really nowhere else to go but down. So, I mean, I think right now they've only lost. Well, hold games. on now. Before that, we do have Bethune Kit, uh, Cookman up next. Yeah. So, there, there's hope. Yeah, yeah. We we need to get some good uh, good energy going into this year. And we did we did beat FAU one to zero. But let me say this about that: the pitching has been stellar all season long. Yeah. So, um, but that's that's kind of the the trend going into the Big Twelve is a lot of great pitching teams, a lot of great defensive teams with Texas, Oklahoma, a lot is, of teams. Which is crazy because we played a lot of good teams the last couple of years. Um, Jada Cody did set uh, records for the uh, triple. Um, for, for triples at, at UCF, but her season just not has, has not panned out as we thought it would. And so. what's crazy, she's playing, like if you look at the numbers, she's has good numbers. It's, again, I think it's different playing teams, you know, maybe a midweek game versus seeing them three games in a row. Um, I think just so much more game planning, so much more strategy goes behind it. So once we, again, you go and you play Texas, you play Oklahoma, you play – Baylor's, yeah, we could beat them, you know, in a game one, a one game in the middle of the week on a Wednesday night. Yeah, you could get those wins, but when you're playing them Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's much harder. All right. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. So hopefully uh, we'll see a uh, a big win against BCU and we do well against Oklahoma because I think we play Oklahoma at home this time, right? Yeah. I think yeah. this is senior night for the girls. So. All right. So make sure you support them. If you can make it out there, it's still a great time. Uh, they they play well. Um, it's just not the special season uh, this year, and yeah. primarily because of the hitting. All right. Uh, let's move on to the quick update on other UCF sports that Allen does not watch. So on the sports that Alan doesn't watch, he doesn't watch women's tennis. And since Alan doesn't watch women's tennis, yeah, he, doesn't you know, guys, don't lie. he doesn't know that they won the first round of the Big 12 tournament uh, versus Kansas 4-3. They were eliminated versus number one Oklahoma State. They finally beat us in a sport. Uh, actually, they no, beat no, us. No, they, the beat, they beat us. They beat us before in women's sports, yes, including yes, women's correct, tennis correct. early in I the was, season. I was just let me let let me do my thing. So, <laughs> so and, and honestly, something I actually was paying attention to, like we got the first, we got the first match, and we once we got to doubles, we just got floored in doubles. We had actually three other matches that were getting close to possibly being. A potential win but then it just kind of every, the 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 wheels fell off um now men's tennis this i like, might be the first time we've lost to ohio ohio state geez oklahoma state in a men's sport we lost to them four three in the big 10 tournament but alan wouldn't know that because he doesn't watch it but actually I, I wrote the show notes so i do know all of this <laughs> <laughs> Play with oh, the bit. Oh, that's perfect. Stick that, to that. the bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is next. Well, I said you didn't watch it, um, but you do. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. Uh, UCF softball, Definitely. as Trey said, uh, they beat FAU 1-0, and they were swept by Baylor. Uh, as Roger was saying earlier, they're playing Bethune, Cookman University next, and then against a kind of good team in Oklahoma. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that update. And thank you, Alan, for that comedic relief. That was uh, that was hilarious. I think I laughed as hard as Trey did last week at the end of the show, which uh, for those of you that have not done this, go ahead. It's like 10 seconds left and and record uh, on slow Trey laughing. It's hilarious. I laughed at it all week and I sent it to the guys. So uh, thank you guys for uh, for braving through. We managed. We were, we were planning on a short show. We were like, oh, there's not much this to talk death, about. Man. And we are now two hours and three yeah. minutes into the show. So thank you. Our for ain't no short, short, man. Wow. Nope, OK, B. Uh, yeah. Uh, Josh even put it in there. So uh, for right now, uh, I do want to say thank you for that compliment, and um, we're going <laughs> we're going to have a great week. Where we've got some interviews coming up, uh, and we'll talk about the eighty team um, the eighty team uh, construct that was actually floated. It was an actual construct that was presented. Uh, unfortunately not taken advantage of right now, <laughs> um, but uh, something we'll talk about next week. So thanks, guys. Have a great week. Go Knights and charge on. Charge on. See, Trey, you need to get that fish out of the blur because that's a nice 
nice big fit.